This week on Inside History, we talk to Dr. John Wolfe, the author of The Wonders, lifting the curtain on the freak show, circus and Victorian age. I just want to start, um, John, by asking what prompted you to write this book in the first place? Yeah, it's a kind of strange one, isn't it? Um, you know what? It's been like a freakish obsession of mine for about 20 years. And uh, when I was about nine years old, I watched David Lynch's film, The Elephant Man. Oh, that's brilliant. Film. Such that's a good, good film. Yeah. But, you know, as a nine year old, it's also quite scary. And I remember vividly at the time feeling this sense of like fear. Um, as the elephant man emerges from the shadows of mm. Victorian London. And yet at the same time feeling a kind of real compassion for Joseph Merrick, the man behind behind the, the mask. Um, and that, that moment almost planted the seeds um, of a fascination with difference and otherness and freakishness, which ultimately sprouted in, you know, as an undergraduate, when I started looking at the history of psychiatry, then when I did my doctorate, I turned that into looking at physical difference um, in the sort of Victorian freak show, and then ultimately the book as well. So I've been with this subject for about 20 years, um, and I'm only 30. So it really is a freakish obsession, but one that was born from, from quite a young age. I think, I think the thing that I love most about The Elephant Man is that, yes, he, he's, he's, he's got the bag over his head when he enters the Royal London Hospital. Yes, we get to see parts of it. David Lynch does it in such a great way where we only see so much. Yeah. He, he shows us what we want to, he wants to show us. But the most amazing thing about that is once we start seeing the character of Joseph Merrick, who is, who is called John in, in, in the film, but his real name's Joseph. Um. And we start seeing them as more human. Yeah. We start seeing him as more human. Is is was that something which really mattered to you when you're going away writing about a book about sideshow freaks? Absolutely. That was what was that was a kind of the core of my project was trying to humanize those who had been deemed other and different in the Victorian period, and actually since then have been often presented in quite sensational ways. And you know, David Lynch's film was quite a sensitive portrayal of, of Joseph Merrick. But that film itself is interesting because David Lynch, you know, the arch postmodernist filmmaker, actually wrote the film based on one narrative at the time, a rather sentimental narrative constructed by uh, Joseph Merrick's surgeon, Frederick Treves. And Treves wrote this memoir um, in the 20th century, early 20th century, where he presented Joseph Merrick's life in the freak show as one of abject horror and debasement and cruelty and exploitation. And his sort of salvation in the London hospital where he was presented uh, in, this, in this refuge and he could spend his remaining days in quiet leisure. So it was quite a sentimental Victorian portrait mm. of Joseph Merrick's story. But when Frederick Treve Pope wrote and uh, published his memoir, there was actually a counter narrative from one of the showmen who had exhibited Joseph Merrick at the London hospital. And he wrote, uh, actually attacking Treves, saying, you know, the way you've presented our showman as sort of basely exploiting mm. Joseph Merrick is unfair. He was well treated in the freak show. And you, Mr. Treves, was the one that really exploited him. He became a medical freak in your institution. You put him on display to your medical friends. You denied him a life mm. of independence and agency. Um, so Joseph Merrick's life is actually constructed with different narratives. And David Lynch's film uses one narrative, the surgeon's narrative, but actually it's much more complex. Yeah. So that was kind of one of the things that fascinated me about the story of Joseph Merrick more generally. How do you read his experiences? Because David Lynch would have us believe one thing, whereas actually the reality was a bit more complex. Yeah, because I mean, when I think back to that film, the, the owner of Joseph Merrick um, is quite nasty to him. Mm. I, I, I vividly remember now where he, he, he whacks the belt yeah. on him and says, stand up, stand up. Yeah. But I, cause I've, I've done quite a bit of uh, reading on it myself as well. And, and the, the, the real, was it Tom Norman? Tom Norman, Tom yeah. Norman. He always comes across as quite a respectable man, an entrepreneur of, of type. Absolutely. So he wouldn't obviously treat someone like that 
necessarily because that's his livelihood. Yeah, totally. And that was what he... Tre- Frederick Trees publishes his memoir where it has this story of the elephant man and Tom Norman responds um, in a series of articles claiming exactly that. He was like, we never treated Joseph Merrick like that. It would have been terrible for business if we did treat him like that. And actually he was very grateful to us because prior to his time in the freak show, Joseph Merrick was incarcerated in the workhouse, um, which as we all know, was a, a place of real mm. sort of uh, horror and dependency. And Joseph Merrick himself was a working class man from Leicester and living in a workhouse, being dependent um, was a real sort of hit to one mm. sense of masculinity. And so in Joseph Merrick's own autobiography, uh, again, another narrative of his story, which is often forgotten, he says, I decided to leave the workhouse Mm. and seek employment in the freak show where I was well treated. Um, And Tom Norman reminds us of this fact and and stresses that, you know, Joseph Merrick was well treated in uh, in the freak show on the whole. Um, And when we look at the life of of Tom Norman, um, there's nothing to suspect that he would have mistreated Joseph Merrick and no evidence Mm. of that other than what the surgeon, Frederick Treves, uh, claimed. Going back to the workhouse, because that was always the one last place you never wanted to go yeah. to. Could we therefore make an argument that for people who were physically deformed or even mentally deformed uh, at that time, the freak shows and going on the, the road of the freak shows was actually better for them? Yeah, that, I mean, that's the sort of, that's at the, the, that's kind of the central difficult question in all of this. Was the freak show exploitative or did it empower people? Did it present choice for people who were disabled or was it a space of coercion? And the truth is, there's no simple answer. Just like today's entertainment industry, sometimes uh, talent is exploited, sometimes it isn't. It's the same with the world of the freak show. Um, Now, those who defend the freak show as a form of entertainment would claim exactly that, that there are alternatives were destitution in the workhouse or committed to to a mental asylum or you know a life on the margins of society earning very little um and the freak show gave them agency it gave them independence it gave them a mean to earn their own uh, income and in the 19th century it often created international celebrities we think of the freak show as this sort of dark marginal affair no, in the 19th century, it was respectable, theatrical, and it created the celebrities of their generation. So was that preferable to a world of the workhouse and the asylum? Um, and, you know, typical historians answer, sometimes it was in certain cases, sometimes it wasn't. Um, but that's one of the reasons why this is so fascinating in the history of disability as well, because, you know, it provokes all of these these questions. And, of course, some of them didn't actually go into the official freak show carnival mm. kind of atmosphere some of them were actually kind of like self-employed yeah in that sense where they um allowed people to come into their homes and uh, in particular i'm thinking of uh, daniel lambert mm. um could you tell us more about him yeah so he, he's an amazing character he uh, put himself on display in 1806 when he was in his 30s and about 56 stone wow. so you know Big, big fat man. Yeah. Billed as a big fat man, one of world's wonders. Um, and he come. He was from uh, Leicester originally, and he comes down to London, puts himself on display uh, in Piccadilly, number 53 Piccadilly, in 1806. And he puts out advertisements in the Times, and there was a couple of bill posters. And this wasn't, you know, the freak show of performance or singing or, or dancing. This was uh, Daniel Lambert sitting, receiving guests. They'd pay a, pay a shilling, um, they'd go and visit him at his apartment, and it was billed as an apartment, and they'd converse with him. And by all accounts, he was a very good conversationalist. He was a man who uh, was really attuned with country sport and country pursuits, and um, they'd have a conversation. And that was your sort of kind of early, it wasn't really a formal freak show, it was an early form of display that, that many people with bodies deemed different uh, would, would utilise. And the clients who would attend or the audience were of a sort of more refined, in quotation marks, mm. variety because it was priced at, at about a shilling. And of course, Daniel would have probably done this all himself. It would, it, there was no manager or anything like that attached or... Well, yes, probably. So again, it's quite interesting because the... 
One of the difficult things about this subject is extracting the truth from the fiction in the sources. Mm -hmm. And the sources would have us believe, and most of these sources come from 19th century eccentric biographies, which are sort of a compendium of uh, biographies on eccentric characters. And they say that Joseph, uh, sorry, Daniel Lambert presented himself. He was too noble a man to be hired by a showman, showman at the time having quite a nasty reputation. So yes, we assume that he presented himself uh, without any help, that he was his own showman. Yet there are certain things, and I raise this in my book, which make us question the veracity of that statement. And it, it seems almost impossible that, you know, he went on a tour around the UK. Um, he was very attuned to um, how to present himself. And he was a great businessman as well. Um, but there's questions, you know, he probably did have some help. Um, yet the sources aren't forthcoming because they mm. wanted to present Lambert as a sort of noble gentleman mm -hmm. um, who was incidentally fat. So probably he was his own showman, but he might have had assistance as well. Mm, well, I mean, I find that quite interesting because it's almost as if the marketing plan for him is there is no showman associated. Exactly, yeah. Because we know how bad they are. Mm. Um, but But it's not always about showman, is it? Because... Um, there is another one who you talk about in the book, who, who I find fascinating as well, Jeffrey Hudson, yeah. who is nothing to do with the freak show. He's the precursor to it in yeah. some respects, but he's with royalty. Absolutely. T what, tell me more about that. Yeah, I mean, jo uh, his life, Hudson's life is incredible, really. 1626, um, he served, believe it or not, in a pie, a cold baked pie, which was brought into this banqueting room to be served to Queen Henrietta Maria, 15 year old wife to King Charles I. And Geoffrey is sort of encased in this pie. He breaks through this pie. He marches up the banqueting table to the astonishment of the audience, waving flags. And he returns to the queen and takes this low bow. And from that moment, um, Geoffrey Hudson and Queen Henrietta Maria are inseparable. He goes to live with, with her mm. in her royal residences. He's given basic schooling, uh, learns how to hunt. He performs in plays and, and their theatricals. Um, and age 21 is actually given a salary of, um, uh, I think it's about 50 pounds per annum. Now, why I included Jeffrey Hudson in the story was exactly as you say, he was not a freak show, but he was a forerunner. He was kept by the English royals for amusement and presented to royal guests as entertainment. Um, but again, like we were talking about with Joseph Merrick, there's complex dynamics going on here because mm -hmm. his, you know, the, the options for a person of short stature, I should say that Jeffrey Hudson uh, was... Uh, a person of short stature, 18 inches tall, aged seven years old when he was presented to the Queen. Their opportunities in life were very limited, but he was brought into the centre, the royal sanctum, and he went on to lead this extraordinary life. He kills a man in a duel, he fights for the royals during the English mm -hmm. Civil War, he's banished from courts, get captured by pirates, enslaved, you name it, Geoffrey Hudson lived it. So his life is really fascinating in and of itself tells us something interesting about the 17th century and 17th century culture and society. But also in my kind of broader narrative, it's an important forerunner mm. to, the, to the Victorian freak show. And then you can also, of course, link Geoffrey to the much later Tom Fun. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and how, how that's varied over time. Because once P.T. Barnum gets... General Tom Fum, he turns it into something completely different, doesn't he? Yeah, absolutely. And again, you know, with so General Tom Thumb, real name Charles Stratton, another person of short stature, and the turning point in his international fortunes, he had been a massive hit in America in the early 1840s. He comes to the UK 1844, and his change in fortunes in, in London and the UK was when he met Queen Victoria three times. Um, and she was wowed with him. And suddenly Barnum presented Tom Thumb, his, you know, quote, amusing dwarf, as someone with royal connections. He was the pet of the palace, the queen's dwarf. And this really propelled Tom Thumb into popular consciousness and actually international celebrity. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, the, the kind of comparisons with Geoffrey Hudson, you've got person of short stature used for entertainment, connected to royalty, which improved their mm -hmm. status, yet... Tom Thumb was operating in the world 
of the Victorian freak show, this popular form of entertainment. And um, he and Barnum made a hell of a lot of money as a result. I mean, because Barnum himself is an interesting character yeah. in this story. I mean, it, just in case anyone's watched The Greatest Showman and think that Hugh Jackman looks like P.T. Barnum, it's the complete opposite of really, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's... Uh, Let's be honest, um, I don't think P.T. Barnum's going to turn many heads no. compared to Hugh Jackman. Um, but, but the film itself is interesting, isn't it? Because it sets up a different narrative of Barnum, which one of which probably Barnum would be quite proud of. Yeah, I love it. Uh, <laughs> but at the same time, it's largely not true. Yeah. We have to view it as a, as a, as a film. Um, when did P.T. Barnum become obsessed with doing these kind of things with the American Museum and stuff like that. Yeah, so that, I mean, so he was he was a sort of travelling showman, a man in between jobs mm. in the 1830s. Um, and it was really in 1841 when he purchases the American Museum mm -hmm. that he sort of really embarks on a career in the entertainment industry. And that's when he starts kind of collecting, for want of a better word, freak performers to put on display. Now, what the film does is present Barnum as this, you know, this great hero. And don't get me wrong, like, it's got wonderful music. I love uh, the film. Good songs. Good songs. But uh, <laughs> the history's crap. It was really bad. Um, and, you know, again, I'm not one of these historians that, like, picks holes through through these things because there's a different medium as trying to do mm. something, blah, blah. Mm. But it missed a massive opportunity and it totally whitewashed the past. And the truth is, P.T. Barnum first found fame on the back of a senile, paralysed, elderly slave named Joyce Heth, who Barnum lugged across the northeast of America, displaying her as the 161-year-old nurse of George Washington. Now, she was, of course, not 161 years old. She was more likely 80. Um, and when she died on, on the job, Barnum organised a public dissection of her body and made a lot of money. And this kind of was his first sort of exposure um, to sort of popular culture. This, that moment really propelled him into the minds of mm -hmm. the American public. Now, we don't hear any of that in The Greatest Showman. We don't know that Barnum was a slave owner who did lug this old woman around, who did once whip a slave 50 times when he suspected him of, sleeve, no, of stealing. You know, Barnum was a man of his times and he's got blotches on his moral record. Um, and in a way, I thought it was a shame that the film didn't offer a bit more nuance to Barnum's character. But it was after Joyce Heth that he purchases the American Museum in 1841. And in 1842, he comes across Charles Stratton, uh, four years old, 23 inches tall. And Barnum transforms him for the stage into General Tom Thumb, who becomes one of the world's first international celebrities. Um, so that's kind of the moment that Barnum really sort of explodes onto the, the scene. Could, could we make the argument that with The Great Showman, he, he Hugh Jackman, the, as as Barnum, portrays Barnum as kind of like an everyman, mm. whereas in reality he was actually exploitative. Could yeah. we could we make that argument? You could definitely make the argument. I wouldn't. It's so hard because you know there's always a danger in applying twenty first century standards mm. to you know nineteenth century men. And I stress Barnum was a man of his time, but and he changed over time as a, as an individual. But, you know, he was a slave owner. He was, at the time, accused of exploitation. He put Charles Stratton, General Tom Thumb, on stage when he was four years old. Mm -hmm. um, there were allegations of animal cruelty, child cruelty. Um, as I said, he was a slave owner. So you could definitely make the claim that this was a man who exploited performers. But he also made people into stars and celebrities. General Tom Thumb earned a good salary. Um, and, you know, Barnum had a lot of, of, of goodness in his heart as well. Mm -hmm. So he's a complex man of his time, but you could definitely argue that he was uh, exploitative. Um, but I wouldn't go too much to the extreme either because he, mm -hmm. he had some noble qualities as well. Because Tom from Charles Stratton is actually buried near yeah. uh, P.T. Barnum as well. Um, the, 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 I think is, is then, there's not much distance that separates them. No, which, tiny distance. Which kind of distance. tells us a lot about their relationship. Absolutely. And that he wanted to be near him. Yeah. Um, yeah, they're buried in Bridgeport, Connecticut. Um, and, you know, they had a very close relationship. And when Barnum became bankrupt in 1856, 
it was Tom Thumb who writes to Barnum and says, you know, my dear friend, I see you're in difficulty. Let me go on stage and help you recover your fortunes, mm -hmm. which is a really kind of touching, touching offer that, that Barnum did ultimately take up. Uh, and shows the closeness in their yeah. relationship. And in my book, I look at a bit more closely at, at their dynamics, which in the early days was quite sort of, Barnum was almost a sort of paternal figure to, mm. to Charles Stratton, who was very young when, when he was uh, being displayed in America and then Europe. So yeah, he did have a close relationship uh, with Charles Stratton, as he did with a number of freak performers he hired, mm. although it could be strained with others. And you know the harrowing story of Joyce Heth always sort of lingers in my mind because that's that's a that's you know that's that's a hard one to swallow that mm. really that's... tarnished Barnum's image in my mind. But absolutely, I mean, but there is another interesting link with the the, the slave ownership because there was another pair who who did go off and do the same thing. Chan mm. Neng, yeah, the famous Siamese twins, um, and they had wives and children yeah. and slaves. Does does their story tell us just exactly how successful these freak shows actually were at the time? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, again, you know, they have this really interesting life discovered in Siam, today's Thailand, in 1824, brought over to the West for uh, display as uh, freaks of nature, the Siamese twin brothers, as they were billed. Um, connected by a, leg a ligament just below their mm. breastbone. And they kind of did performances and acrobatics on stage and answered questions. And they had, in their early years, they were under the control of their Western protectors, as they were known. Um, and they were kind of mistreated. They were underpaid. They were overworked. They were essentially kind of owned by, by these protectors. But when they hit their 21st birthday, they decided that they were going to leave these protectors and become their own freak showmen and their own freak businessmen. And as a result, they became very successful. They made a lot of money, about $10,000 they saved thanks to their freak show. And they retired from the business to um, Wilkes County in North Carolina, where they established plantations. They married two local girls. They had over 20 children between them and they owned slaves. So the Siamese twins on stage were fathers and farmers and slave owners off stage, um, which is kind of incredible reversal of fortune. Um, you really can't make this kind of stuff up. But for me, it was also interesting because there's another danger in all of this where we assume that a freak performer is a mere passive agent who's exploited and um, ill-treated. And actually Chang and Eng and a number of the performers I look at in my book fight back. You know, they did have power. They did have control over their own lives. And they leave us with quite an uncomfortable legacy. Chang and Eng were slave owners. They dealt in child slavery. Um, you know, what, what do you make of that? That was their normal. You know, uh, uh, they're very, very complex. So, so what does the freak show actually tell us about the Victorian age? It tell, I mean, so much. This is the thing. I mean, going back to what I said earlier, like we think of the freak show as this marginal affair. Um, but it was absolutely central to Victorian society. It was the popular, it was the expression of popular culture. Men, women and children, the middle classes, working classes, royalty, Queen Victoria, Abraham Lincoln, scientists, anthropologists, ethnographers, they all came to the freak show. Everyone loved the freak show. Um, and as a result of that, the freak show opens up um, a world for us to further fathom the nature of popular culture, the way that the freak show was presented and advertised tells us something about broader discourses at the time, about medicine, about sexuality, about mm -hmm. gender, about science. Um, and also I looked a lot at people's responses to, to the freak show. And again, this illuminates broader, broader themes. So the freak show, by its very nature, is, uh, it often presented itself as quite a topical um, form of entertainment it really opens up the world of the victorian age in very interesting ways so, so what brought about the end of the freak show because it uh, one moment it's the biggest show in town and yeah. the next moment it's gone yeah uh, w why did it end in that way yeah so i mean you know the height of its popularity 1840s to about 1914 and it kind of lingered on into the 1940s um, but there were a number of factors that were leading to its decline. One was the rise of, of science and medicine, mm. and that meant that 
you know, scientists were increasingly explaining away the anomalies on stage. You know, they suddenly started to understand some of the conditions that these freak performers had. And once you do that, you kill the wonder and mm. the mystique. Mm. They also started claiming freak bodies. So rather than um, freak performers being on stage, a number were increasingly institutionalized, whether in hospitals or mental asylums. And science was co so-called correcting the anomalous body and you know, trying to separate Siamese twins or conjoined twins, for example. So you have the rise of science, you've got the rise of other forms of popular entertainment, um, the cinema in particular, um, really sort of competed with the freak show and ultimately you know, superseded the freak show as this expression of popular culture. And you know, massively, the First World War, and that produced disabilities on an industrial scale. Mm -hmm. So afterwards, it no longer seemed that appealing to go gawp at uh, people deemed different on stage. Um, you know, so these were sort of some of the major factors which ultimately led to, to the decline of the freak show. But it did kind of linger on. <laughs> oh, the cat's here. The cat's here. Hey, Paul. <laughs> it did linger on into the 1940s and even beyond. But, you know, it was a shell of its former self. But it still kind of carried on. In it, but in a different format, didn't it? Because we've got um, Todd Browning's film Freaks. Yeah. We then go on a few decades later and we have um, the ma uh, Mask starring Eric Stoltz, The Elephant Man, which, of course, yeah. uh, you watched at nine years old. <laughs> um, so, so it still kind of exists even today, our, our own fascination with things like this. Absolutely. Like the, the Victorian freak show has sort of morphed into different forms of, of culture and popular culture that are still with us. And if you think about the central ingredients of sensationalism, voyeurism and titillation and an obsession with, with difference, that is still with us. Body worlds, um, our gossip magazines, TV documentaries, you, you know, it's still, it's still there. Uh, reality TV being a prime example. Um, so the freak show as an institution might have died, but its legacy lives on. Well, with the cat now. <laughs> and uh, it's a very lovely cat. Uh, you can't see the cat. It's absolutely jet back and it's absolutely beautiful. <laughs> it's got this fascination with jumping on the table and uh, trying to wreck this podcast for the end of it. So I think it's probably about time to end it now. Um, so uh, thank you very much, John. Cool, Wolf, pleasure. And, uh, if you... The Wonders, Lifting the Curtain on the Freak Show, Circus and Victorian Age, written by Dr. John Wolfe and published by Michael O'Mara. It's available from all good bookshops now.